What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 818, with my guest today, Sensei Gage Hanlon. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick. And if you're unfamiliar with Whistlekick, you should check out whistlekick.com because you'll see all the things that we do for you, the traditional martial artists of the world. We have a saying here, connect, educate, and entertain. And that's really what we're about. Everything that we put out from our products to our shows, to our events, is meant to connect traditional martial artists, to educate you in some fashion, and hopefully to entertain you, whether that means you laugh or you smile or you just have a good time. And the best things that we do, do all three. And this show does all three. Maybe not all at the same time, but it does do all three. And why do we do all of this? Because we believe that traditional martial arts makes people better. It brings out the best in us. And if we can get more people to train, in fact, if we can get everyone in the world to train for just six months, we think the world would be a much, much better place. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And if you go to whistlekick.com, you'll see all the things that we're doing. And one of the things you'll see there is a store because this show and the things that we do do cost money. How do we pay for those things? Well, we sell some stuff. If you use the code podcast15, P-O-D-C-A-S-T-1-5, you're going to save 15% on a whole bunch of stuff. If you didn't know, that's one of the best discounts. In fact, it is the best discount that we offer continually. We give that best discount to you, the listener, because we value you coming by week after week. And we do some other stuff, too. Now, Martial Arts Radio, this show, gets its own website because we've got so many episodes, it needs its own spot. So what are you going to find over there? Well, yeah, you'll find all the episodes we've ever done, but you're also going to find transcripts and show notes and videos and links to social media, all kinds of cool stuff, like for today's guest. Now, if you love what we do, if you consider yourself part of our family, or if our mission just seems to make you nod and say, yeah, I think that's a good thing, here are a couple things you can consider doing. You could leave us a review anywhere. Anywhere that you could leave a review that seems to make sense, please consider leaving a review. It won't take you very long. Podcast reviews are the best. You could join our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. It starts at $2 a month. If you want behind the scenes on how episodes come to be or who's coming up on the show or even bonus episodes, because we release a lot of bonus content, you can get in there for just a few dollars a month. And it, again, helps cover our expenses. Now, today's guest, Gage Hanlon, Sensei Gage Hanlon, is someone I've been looking forward to talking to for a while. And if you stick around, if you're somebody who listens to the show with a certain, well, in order, I guess is the best way to put it, you'll know why very, very soon. But here we are, I get the chance to talk to him. Now, this is someone I've been aware of for a long time someone I've never had conversation with. We've never emailed. We've never Facebooked. I've never seen him in an event. So this is all completely green for me. But what I saw in our conversation was a story that we're hearing more and more lately. Someone for whom fate or destiny, if you believe in such things, just seemed to pull him on the right path to make sure that his life was a martial arts life. And I'm not going to say any more than that, because I think anything else I say might take out some of the impact. So we'll leave it there. And here's my conversation with Gage Hanlon. Hey, Gage. How are you? Good. How about you? I'm, I'm well, thank you. It's a beautiful day here. Just went out for a walk, ready oh. to go. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's start in the obvious way because it gives us an opportunity to just kind of spider out. It's a martial arts show. You're a martial artist. You have a martial arts company. How'd you get started in martial arts? All right. So I'm going to try to keep the timeline as clear as possible because it's been a minute since I started. <laughs> so some things might get uh, sure. jump around a little bit. But um, so kindergarten. 1996 mm -hmm. so i don't know if that's young or old for anybody who's listening or watching but we'll see right this is this is your story the, the real yeah so, doesn't really matter. so 96 yeah. um pretty sure it was like august or september <clears throat> i came home from school and 
uh, watch cartoons, right? Get home from school. First thing you do, you got to watch cartoons. Right. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were on. And I told my mom, said, Mom, I want to be a Ninja Turtle. And uh, she just happened to work with somebody uh, who had uh, a school. It was a guy that had, you know, his his house in town and he had a detached garage and he built it out as a dojo. Um, so that's how I got started. I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. Uh, I didn't quite grow the shell yet, so I'm still working on that. Uh, but pretty, pretty close. Okay. What do you remember, if anything, about those early days? Um, it was love and obsession from day one. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, one of those things, like, I always reflect back on it that I tried other things as well while I was doing, you know, my my training, baseball, soccer, you know, all sorts of things along like that. One, one season, two season at most with that stuff. Other than that, I was always going to class, always training. I didn't get to spend much time with friends during the week because at, you know, this was back during the days of like, you want to come to class three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, you know, depending on your interests or whatever. And man, I wanted to be there all the time, all the time. So it was, uh, obsession is probably an understatement, mm -hmm. even as a kid. Now you teach, I don't know if you teach kids as young as you were when you started, mm -hmm. but anybody who has knows that getting a kindergarten age child that committed to literally anything oh, yeah. is incredibly difficult. And I suspect it says something not only about you, but also your instructor. And we're going to talk about you quite a bit. Let's any any perspective on what your instructor might have been doing that kept you so engaged? I don't know if it was what he was doing. He was um National Guard. Okay. So it was it was intense, right? And it was it was mixed class, right? This was back when like, you know, oh you got teens, adults, kids. It was, uh, we got a five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock class kind of thing. Everybody's mixed in together. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your age was. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it probably just from what little I can comment on as an instructor looking at kids and, and things like that, there's something to be said about discipline, regimen, consistency, mm -hmm. things like that. And um, the guy was scary. <laughs> he was a scary <laughs> guy. So it was one of those things like, you know, as a kid, you have this like, I'll call it like fearful respect for somebody. Like, I mm -hmm. don't, I don't want to disappoint anybody. I don't want to disappoint him. And there sure. were others too that were, you know, um, senpai or, or something like that not yet yep. black belts when i started but there were others that were helping me as well i mean there's one guy that i totally credit um anything of during those hard times of of training on keeping me going and pushing me even when my instructor wasn't the one doing it so um i have to give credit where credit's due but mm -hmm. i think just it was like i said i my instructor you know ran the class it was it was military-esque in a sense you know um but i really just think that it was mainly about i found something that i really latched onto mm -hmm. it matched what i saw on tv um i got to be doing something physical mm -hmm. um moving my body you know i i think i just missed the cutoff in the uh time where they started looking at kids like oh what's this add stuff you know i think i just missed the cutoff for it if i'd have been born a few years later i might have fallen into that a little bit yeah. so it was just something that i could really like get my energy out on take all my you know kindergarten crazy self and put into it and not be ridiculed right like mm -hmm 
you could be as crazy as you wanted because you were doing combative. So, yeah, I think, you know, that's probably like most of that comes from. I think the other interesting question to ask from that time is what your parents thought about this. Yeah. So I have, uh, you know, whenever I meet somebody new or whether it's, you know, somebody at a tournament or somebody at a seminar or a new parent, you know, signing their kid up with us, it's not an uncommon thing. So do your parents do it too? Nope. <laughs> it was, it was me, you know, my, uh, my dad, he, uh, boy, he was a hard worker. Like he was, you know, he had a 12 hour job. So he, uh, he was supporting us from a financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mom, she was, uh, I was her baby, you know, like what, what Gage wants, he's going to get kind of thing. So, mm. you know, spoiled in other ways too, but you know, they both just saw how much I really enjoyed it, how much I was pushing myself. I can imagine from a parent standpoint, I mean, I have my own kid. Uh, when you see them latch on to something, you you want to give them everything you can to help them keep going with it. Yeah. So it was, I mean, when we started really getting into tournaments and things like that, I would not be surprised if I asked my mom, you know, how often were we gone on a weekend? Probably close to every weekend. I mean, we were, I loved doing tournaments. Once I went to my first one, you know, of course, like the, the probability of winning first place at your first tournament, probably not the highest, but I did it. And okay. again, like you, you get that, that reward, like, oh, I put in this hard work. Um, let's do it again. Did so, you start competing right away? Yeah, so I want to say that my, so I started in, I think I'm pretty sure it was September 96. And my first tournament that I went to was February of 97. So, you know, however many months that is, I can't do math at the moment. Six-ish. You know, yeah, you know, six so, months. Um, yeah, so I went, went to my first tournament about six months after. And yeah, I won first place at it. And oh, um yeah, and that's <laughs> that was that kind of kick started that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old were you when you thought martial arts could be something let's lump it all professional for you? That's that's a good question. I guess like I was always thinking about the next thing. Mm -hmm but not necessarily a long-term thing or maybe not in the grand scheme of what it is now, right today. But when I started and really figured out this is for me and seeing, you know, the different colored belts, it was like, okay, I want to earn the next one. I want to earn the next one. Who knows what color belt I was when the mindset changed, like, well, now I want to earn my black belt. Mm -hmm. So that was the next driving piece. It was no longer the next one. It was here's here's this level. Um, then as I was getting closer to it, you find out, oh, there's multiple degrees of black belt. Well, I want that. I want to I want to keep earning higher black belt rank. Then it started to become where. Oh, one day I'd like to to teach. I'd like to do, you know, have my own school. Um get there eventually it's a boy i'd really like to combine everything that i've learned mm -hmm. and use that to teach all right we get there next one i'd love to have my own tournament i did that i'd love to create my own belt i did that i'd love to work at a company that makes belts i did that so it's always been that next piece mm -hmm. and just kind of figuring out when I get to that, okay, what are the other sections that I'm missing to make this a reality? Mm. And it definitely like, I got there with my parental support. If I did not have that, I definitely don't think I'd be where I am today or would have achieved half the things that I have with mm. the martial arts. What I'm finding interesting in the way you're talking about this, you're talking about being really driven and always looking for kind of what's that next thing? What's that evolution? Mm -hmm. What do I want to try? 
But when you described your relationship with your mother, you, you mentioned, you know, that you were spoiled. You couldn't have been too spoiled because people who grow up spoiled don't go on to do these sorts of things, right? Like they're used to having things kind of given to them. And, and anybody who's run a school, started a company, hosted a competition knows that those are very difficult things to do that require a lot of time, effort, creativity, money, and are often quite thankless. Mm -hmm. So where does the other half that balances the, what you described as being spoiled come into play? Um, well, first off, I'd say you're, you're definitely wrong about me not being spoiled. <laughs> only, only cause like I said, I had, you know, I was, I was the, the only child, so to speak. Mm -hmm in the household, I was the baby and it was, it was the thing, you know, um, now my, my dad was very much so of the mindset of, we have to pick and choose the things that I'm spoiled with, you know, like okay. eating out was not a thing. You just, we're not going to waste our money on something like that. Right. And it rings even true for me today, you know, in our current environment, like, yeah, we can't, we can't eat out, you know, it, you start to see these things, of course, like reflected as you become, become the adult and a parent. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, we had our, we had our house, like we lived out in, in the country, um, away from town. So had to get creative with my own entertainment a lot, you know, friends were not all that close. Like it was, you know, probably a couple miles to, oh, we have to go into town if we want to go do anything. So it, mm -hmm. that probably helped out a lot. But, you know, the spoiled thing comes into like if there was something that I really was jonesing for and I could convince them of it. OK, we got there eventually. Um, but you definitely had like the the disciplined mm. side of it, too, of the, you know, hey, you have to understand why you're not getting this thing that you want. But now look at what you can do instead. We can go to this tournament. We can keep training. We can travel to these things, you know. Um, so credit goes to dad for sure. With yes. With being, okay. So there it is. So there's the balance. Yeah, being the financial guy. <laughs> All right. Was, yeah. you know, Makes sense. I see it. Yeah. Now. Okay. When did you start your own school? How old were you? So it's it depends on who you ask after hearing the story. Okay. Right. So um, I don't remember, I was, I think I was a, yeah, I was a second degree black belt at this point in, I'll call it like old school, uh, Chandaquan Taekwondo before like they switched to like the world Taekwondo mm -hmm. system with the Taegooks and whatnot. And then uh, also a second degree in uh, Shorei Shobukan Gojuru. Mm -hmm. um, my instructor halfway through my color belt, uh, in taekwondo system uh started training and learning the gojuru so mm -hmm. i i promoted him both through, oh, through him cool. and and all that so i had a member at one point went to a tournament and don't need to get into it but we had a falling out with with my instructor so um trying Not to figure uncommon. out Right. Trying to figure out where, where I'm going to go, because it wasn't that I was done with with martial arts. Right. It was not an option as far as I was concerned. I just had to find another place to to go. And so I went to um, my instructors, Taekwondo instructor, because they were, you know, 25 minutes away or whatever. Like, OK, we'll make the trek. Hanging out there. Oh boy, I'm trying to remember. I want to say it was during a summer. Um, Christmas time comes around, New Year happens, and show up to class, and the instructor doesn't show up. And I'm, I think, as I said, I can't quite remember where I'm at at this point, age wise, 14 ish, right? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> So instructor doesn't show up to class and students start showing up like, I guess I'm going to teach class today. So that was the pattern for a while. And then um, the instructor's uh, stepson came back to training. He had taken a break for whatever reason. And he was, I don't know, maybe 
I think he was six years older than me or mm -hmm. something like that. So he and I partner up and we just start teaching. Um, so it wasn't my school at that point, right? Um, I think we taught there for maybe a year or so. And then one day the instructor shows up I'm like, hey guys, how's it going? I'm like, good. He says, like nothing awesome. happened. Yeah. And he goes, um, I, uh, I sold the building. You have to get out in two weeks. Okay. <laughs> so, so we're, you know, we're Holy struggling. Cow. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're struggling big time trying to figure out a solution. We, you know, rent out a gym for a little bit at the elementary school and it all just kind of disappears, you know, just because of the inconsistency of location and all this stuff start training somewhere else for a little while. And then my dad, uh, being the guy that he is, he's like, you know, I really want to build this machine shed on our property. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll split it with you. I'll take half and you can have half and you can open up a school. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, you know, gear construction, whatever it was at our open house in September of 2007 mm -hmm. and i'm 16 at this point so officially like my my branding or or whatever you want to call it is september of 2007 was the first time we opened up a school wow. 16 yep what did that feel like um it, it was one of those like it was it was definitely like a, a proud moment but I was very aware of, we'll call it like the stigma of in the martial arts world, right? Like everybody has an opinion and a viewpoint on, on everybody and everything on how things are done. And if it's not the way that they think it should be done, then it's wrong. So I am very aware of this. Um, Related but, to your age, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, 16 year old, you know, been teaching for two, three years beforehand so very aware of that but um it was one of those checklist things that was on my list right like since i was since i was a younger kid like i want to open my own school and made it happen so mm -hmm. of course it wasn't fancy or anything like that it was a machine shed but you know again you want to talk about like the spoiled side of things like dad made sure you know we got to get all the structurally sound things in there but then dress it up how we want you know we mm -hmm. had we had the mats we had the mirrors we had the belt displays tables you know equipment you know that's that's all everything you needed yeah so i'm extremely fortunate you know i know a lot of people don't have that kind of opportunity opening up their first mm -hmm. school um so definitely like fortunate to to have the the family that i did to get me there but it was awesome, you know, and it it felt like in reflection, like starting another legacy for our family. You know, mm. yes, my parents didn't train or anything like that, but here we are, you know, doing something that ultimately impacted the community. Even if we are five miles out of town on a country road kind of thing, you know, and teaching out of a machine shed. But, you know, I think our, our largest number of students that we had was like 25 or so. Um, so not, not bad, bad for a town of 10,000. Small you know. town, out of town, machine yeah. shed in the yeah. backyard. Yeah. So it was actually. really cool. And at some point that changed. It was there, was there talk of you going off to college after high school? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure. So I'm going to guess that the, there, just the way you're smiling, that, that maybe, maybe you weren't quite just, given carte blanche to do what you wanted wanted at that point yeah so it's it's one of those things like i don't know college was always on the table mm -hmm. um and funny enough like it was originally my plan was um to go for uh pharmaceutical mm -hmm. um my dad was a pharmacist so it just was kind of weird that was not the plan because he he uh he had things to say about his job. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if anybody else out there would have guessed that your your father was a pharmacist. Never would have guessed. 
Yeah. Just, just the way you've kind of set him up yeah. would have been pretty far down on my list. Yeah. Yeah. Farm boy, pharmacist, like yeah. <laughs> that's his background. So you wouldn't think so without, without really knowing it. Right. But um, yeah. And it was, it was one of those things like, I didn't know what I wanted to do for college until my junior year of high school. Um, and I took advanced chemistry and I was like, Hey, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, that was kind of how it was. And I, I thought it was so funny, of course, like that I was going to pursue pharmacy. Um, my dad kept trying to talk me out of it, but, uh, <laughs> why <laughs> he, he just said, you know, his opinion on, on how the industry mm. treated, you know, the actual like labor force for, for that or whatever. And some people have it good and some people don't, you know, just with everything. But um, so, you know, that that's, that's kind of like where the pursuit was, but then it always came into question, like, how are we going to do the school mm. and do college? So I was like, well, I'll look around at colleges around, the area so maybe there's a way to balance it closest one that we were looking at was like maybe an hour away so like, eh, how are you going to do that and then uh, we were at a college fair and my dad goes and talks to uh south dakota state university and he comes back he's like all right i set up this this visit like, what are you talking about i'm not going to south dakota he says well i've already done it okay so we go, we go up and I, we, we do the tour and we get done. I, I got to go here. I love it. Really? I, what, what did you love about it? I it's, oh, that's, that's a tough one, but I think it was just like the, the overall setup of the campus, the environment, you know, I'll call it even like the weather and uh, the environmental setting. I don't know. You know, we, I grew up in Iowa, so that's, that's where I'm, I'm based out of. So it's not like I was unfamiliar to like snowstorms and, and blizzards and things like that. I was a fan of the cold. So I don't know. It just, it, it's one of those things, almost a, uh, it's hard to pinpoint, but you can just feel it inside. Yeah. All right. So I didn't, I hadn't promoted anybody to black belt at that point. Um, you know, we're talking two plus years. And I had people who came from a previous school that had earned black belts and came to train with me, but I didn't, at, even after training for two plus years, like they weren't for me, they weren't ready to, to earn the black belt. Um, so that was another, like, what are we going to do here? Kind of thing. Mm. So we had to shut down the school when all mm. was said and done. Um, you know, How so that, that feel? Was, that must have been that really was, difficult. It was a big, big bummer. You know, I obviously like as as a, a teenager and, you know, you get connected to things and hard to say goodbye to people and all that. But it was one of those instances in my life, which I have had a few of if you don't do this, you're going to look back and say, I should have done that. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't end up going to South Dakota State, I would have kicked myself for it the rest of my days. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm just there. curious because it may be some fun synchronicity. So that sounds like 2003? That was in uh, 2009 is when I graduated. Okay. okay, I'm doing really bad math. Then. Yeah. All right. Sorry. You went backwards. You made me younger. That's okay. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. So 09, uh, you know, we have our last summer with mm -hmm. the school and then have to close it down and go and do my college thing. Mm -hmm. um, while I was there, I took judo for a month. Um, but being in honors college up there, I was in honors chemistry my first semester. And that was a brutal class. So I had to drop judo so I could go to all the study sessions that the professor had set up. And uh, I don't remember when it was exactly. I think it was later on, like near the end of that first semester. Uh, I found a Taekwondo place up there and I started training with them again. I went in. I didn't tell them I had any training because to me, I'd rather 
go in as as a nobody and you know because it's not it's not my place to say like i'm this you know this rank or whatever and you need to recognize that you know i'd rather just go in as a student like i've always mm -hmm. had that be a student mentality so i start training with them um end of my first semester uh i think my honors cam professor really liked me because how I pulled a C in his class, I don't think was accurate, but I just talked to him enough and, and really like put in effort to show that I was studying and things like that. But um, when I was there, the pharmacy school at South Dakota state, you had to have a 3.8 cumulative GPA for your first two years to even apply. Wow. So like on average, I think they, I think the numbers were like 150 applicants, 75 interviews and like 50 takers kind of thing. So very competitive. Yeah. So pulling a C on an honors chem, I was like, mm, I don't think I'm cut Probably out. Probably not this. getting there. Uh, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I remember talking to my my honors dean and he's like, well, what about entrepreneurial studies? I'm like, what is that? And I never heard of it. Mm -hmm. he's like, you, you know, you've told me about your karate school and and you seem to really have a knack for just wanting to drive these 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 self goals forward. It's like, OK, so I switch to entrepreneurial studies. And sure enough, like that's my thing, like mm -hmm. like the the numbers i like the the marketing i like the you know i'm gonna say selling it sounds very bad but you know okay. showing people what it is that you have to offer and why it's beneficial to them so did that um kept the continuing training on with with the taekwondo school met somebody there who was did, uh, did they figure out you had some experience Oh yeah, first okay. class, right? Okay. First class. Right. So we right. start doing kicking drills. Too hard, then. Yeah, start doing kicking drills, and the instructor goes, "Oh, you have experience." <laughs> I said, yeah. So we chat or whatever. And so they're like, "Well, you have, you know, at this point, third degree." Well, you're a third degree. You know, you could come in as a black belt. I was like, "No, like I want to earn, earn my first degree from you guys. Like I don't mind going up and and learn all this stuff." So one of the students there was actually a first degree in Ishinru karate. So he and I get together, we start training outside of the Taekwondo and in the Ishinru stuff. And I start teaching him, you know, whatever I was doing. And then um, we start a program at the college through their fitness center. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trained in Taekwondo with, with this group. And then we're teaching karate over here. And I'm, I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm learning stuff from two different people. I'm still getting to teach, you know, my stuff. Um, putting into practice now all the fun entrepreneurial studies things that I've I've learned. Um, so we did that for, for two years. I was at South Dakota State. And then um, my family moved to Joplin. Mm -hmm. And... They moved in 2010. Yeah, like October 2010. And then I went down to visit in 2011 in May. And I don't know if you ever heard or recall at this point, but in May of 2011, there was an EF5 tornado in the Joplin area. Mm. And I was down visiting during that tornado and I was at the mall when the tornado came through town and like the mall was a mile away from where like you know there was a mile away of destruction kind of thing yeah. and that was a real like big shock like uh you know from the mall back to my parents new house it was usually a 20 minute drive and it took me two hours to get mm -hmm. back to them um, and no cell phone service either to let them know like i was alive or anything like that so, so they're, they're freaking out Oh yeah. So I get back to him and I'm like, you know, I'm not done with school yet. Um, I need to be closer to family after something like that, mm -hmm. you know, 
being because at that point in South Dakota and Joplin, where I was at, that was like a 10 hour drive, yeah. basically. Um, so I finish up my my spring semester at South Dakota State, transfer down to Missouri Southern. Um, sure enough, like while I'm there, I start training uh, with this guy. Um, I think I trained for a month or two with him. And then again, school gets in the way. Um, so I start focusing on that, kind of get all my academics uh, in order. Oh, I'm ready to teach again. Uh, so I start something at the college. And when you know it, my dad has a machine shed on their new property. And so I'm like, all right, what stuff can we clear out of here? Let's get these mats down. I love it. Um, you so still have the mats. This- they still had the bats. Yeah, we still had the original mats. Oh, yeah, no I don't. You wouldn't think so, right? After no. they move or whatever, what what a thing to keep. But you know, trophies and all came with them when they moved down there. Uh, so teaching at the college, teaching out of out of a machine shed. Um, so we did that for. Let me think. Where am I at here? 20, 2011, Yeah, twenty eleven. Um, until 2015 now we're now we're 20 2015 right at this point like my wife and i um we actually knew each other when i was in high school i came down to missouri for a tournament and we met there and we connected and we stayed in touch the whole time like i'm in iowa i'm in south dakota she's still in missouri but i moved down to missouri like hey guess where i live now um, so we've, we've been, we've been together since, you know, October of 2011. Um, so she has experience in the martial arts world. So she knows all about like what it is for me, you know, what martial arts means to me. Um, I promote two students to black belt within that time. Mm-hmm. Um, I cried a lot at my first student's black belt test. <laughs> that was a really, you know, I, I say, did say not expect more, say more about so emotional. That. It was, uh, it was something, I guess, like, like, you know, I, my previous teaching experience, I get close to that, but we never got there. Right. And it's something where I would say most instructors can agree with this. Like you get to watch this kid, this person go from where they start at and just looking back on their accumulation of two, three, four years and seeing who they have become and what little part you play in that is just extremely rewarding. Like, you know, for me, always about, you know, like, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing what little I can to help you find yourself, right? Like that's, that to me is, is the big part of it. Why I love teaching so much. Um, so yeah, that, that first, that first student's testing was a really, really impactful moment. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a checklist thing that I had, but it sure did check a box when it happened, you know? Um, so I get done with, with college in December of 2014, uh, marketing degree. Mm -hmm. And I am just, you know, I'm waiting on, on my, uh, fiance at that point to finish up with, with her degree. So she's going to graduate in the spring. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out what to do with this degree. Right. I'm like, I got to get a real job with this degree. I, and if you're listening, he's using air quotes. Yes. Yeah. Air quotes uh, <laughs> on that. I start doing these interviews for like, Oh, sell this makeup made from the dead sea algae and stuff like that oh my gosh like so here's another facet of being spoiled right if i don't like it if i don't believe in it i'm not doing it that's just (laughs) i'm very very spoiled in that sense of i i have you might call it spoiled i call it integrity well sure all right well i like that word better (laughs) it's a little more positive Uh, you know but that it was I just, it wasn't jiving. Like, yeah, I really wanted to do the school, but I had 
I think 12 students at the most, right? So super small. So it definitely wasn't something that could be, at least like in my capacity at that time, something that could be a stable income to support, you know, my soon to be family of my wife and I. Um, so I don't know how many months it was, but my, my fiance wife, whatever I need to refer to her at this timeline, right? Uh, she goes, why don't you look at companies that you do business with for your school? That way you can still be doing things martial arts related. She's smart, by the way. I just, I have to say that now, <laughs> uh, if I don't say it, um, at any other time, she's a very smart woman. <laughs> um, so I'm like, okay, so, uh, company who won't be named, I was like, you know, I do a lot of business with them. Really don't want to relocate to that state. Yep. So I'm like, well, the only other company that I do business with for the school is Kataro. I, my first belt that I ordered from them, I had to go back and look at my account, but I think it was like 2008, right? And since then I was like, oh yeah, fall in love with it, ordered belts for myself or for others from them. I used their belts for grand championship awards for the tournaments that I hosted. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got a big working relationship at this point with them. And I'm like, okay. So I, I send an email and I say, hey, uh, been a, a customer for a while and finished up with school and like to come work for your, your marketing department. And, uh, this is, this is going to be a, a little peek behind the curtain here yeah. for a minute, right? But they said, well, we don't have a marketing department. Okay. So phone calls, emails, set up an in-person interview. So I drive from Missouri up to Illinois, uh, Joliet. So, you know, a little bit outside of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Have my in-person interview. Um, went awesome very nerve-wracking you know i'm i'm a, an adult now i did a job interview <laughs> so um i'm i'm laughing laughing out of understand yeah right um so get back home and i don't remember how many days it was later but i get an email with an offer mm -hmm. oh now reality hit i'm gonna have to leave the school that I've built up. I'm going to have to leave my, my two black belt students again, again. again. And so it's a big conversation that I have with, with my family, um, with, with my, my fiance, wife, whatever we need to say. Um, and it's one of those moments again, where like, it's, it's going to be hard, but if you don't do it, you're going to regret it. Okay. So got to make the announcement in the school. The announcement date to our students could not be worse timed because it was April 1st. Um, so <laughs> I had to preface it by this is not an April Fool's joke. Um, we're going to have to close down the school. I'm going to have to move. My first black belt student, um, they were looking into like other facilities they could rent to start, you know, continue the the training for, for students who wanted to do it kind of thing. So we were trying to figure it out. Um, that unfortunately didn't work out. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of, uh, definitely a lot of gratitude shared and, and all that stuff. So we get to May of 2015, my wife, uh, graduates june of 2015 we get married july of 2015 i start working at Kataro. august of 2015 we find out my wife is pregnant okay i was waiting for that one i knew that one had to come in yeah just the yeah. way you were lining them up yeah because, so because what else is there to tackle with yeah. all of that, that right you know, well, checklist after too. checklist yeah. you know yeah, let's do it all <laughs> so <laughs> um, we moved, we were in a, a one bedroom apartment, 
uh, as all you know newlyweds have its tradition, right? Got to start out that way. Um, and I have one student who consistently keeps training with me via Skype. Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody did it during the pandemic or if anybody has tried to do it, that's a tough thing to do. Not being there in person to, you know, correct stuff or whatever, or, you know, there's just that physicality that's removed from it. But um, I'm very picky with with anybody that I do the online training with. Mm -hmm. And it was a thing where I almost tried to convince them not to do it. I'm like, you know, there's this school here. There's this school here. You know, here's the people that I know in the area that I recommend that you can go train with. This kid was like, oh, gosh, he started training with me when he was three. So I think he was like seven, maybe at this point. And his mom kept telling me he doesn't want to go anywhere else. He wants to train mm -hmm. with you. So I got this kid continuing his training with me you know we'd meet up at tournaments every once in a while we'd get some training in there after he got done competing um he still trains with me via skype um so we're uh that's about the extent of the training the teaching that i'm doing and then i find this um uh, customer of ours at kataro um who is local in the area. Like, All right, well, I'll go check them out. Um, it was recommended by one of one of my coworkers because uh, that's where she was taking her kids to train. Mm -hmm. So I go and funny enough, it was uh, an Ishinru school, uh, which, you know, I had previous experience with while I was in South Dakota. Yeah. Um, I'm like, okay. And I go in, you know, obviously like, you know, hey, I, I work at Kataro. Here's... You know, I've got previous training um, and I go in and man, I really like it. They really focus on the application stuff, which mm -hmm. I had never really gotten mm -hmm. before in my prior training. Like, yeah, we did a little bit of it, you know, like we did one steps in Taekwondo and we had these, you know, set partner drills. But there was always that deeper dive piece that I was missing in my training. So, all right, you know, be the sponge while this thing still works. I'm going to absorb yep. as much as I can kind of thing. Um, so I start training with them. Um, and then uh, that was, yeah, 2015. I think it was 2015 we started doing that. Maybe 2016. I'll have to ask my, my sensei about that. Um, so it's all going good. I'm just teaching through Skype uh, with my one student mm -hmm. doing my training going to tournaments when I can, you know, in a totally different role now, you know, I gotta, gotta rep the brand and, yeah. and all that stuff. And, um, then in 2021, we, uh, Kataro finds a, a building we had to expand because we were just, we were busting at the seams. Um, so we, we find this building and it's uh, a historic Carnegie funded library. Um, and it's in Indiana. So we move uh, in May of 2021 to this new building where we're at now. And of course, what do all libraries have? A basement, right? Yep. I shouldn't say that. I statistically, I don't know if that's actually true if all libraries have a basement, but we're gonna we're gonna say there is at least this one. So you know, we had always talked like after I had moved up here for for the job, boy, it'd be cool to open up a school. Be cool to you know, get a Kataro dojo going. Yeah. Here we are. Now it's what, 2023? We're uh we're coming up on our two year move anniversary. We're coming up on our two year of the school being open. Um things are going awesome. Nice. I want to go back a little bit. Um because you you talked about you know throwing almost this random dart on the wall sending a completely unsolicited email to Kataro. I, I want to work in your marketing department. We don't have a marketing department. And obviously they hired you and obviously the company has grown. And um, I, I think we can assume that your involvement is part of that growth. Mm -hmm. Seems logical. 
But what was it like taking something that you loved, martial arts, and getting a real job that was still themed in martial arts? Um, Like I was saying before, if I don't actually value the thing, mm -hmm. right, it's hard for me to do it. So this was literally marrying prior experience, degree, and passion all into one thing. So yes, I wasn't teaching uh, at a school, which that was definitely a difficulty. You can ask my wife, I was going a little stir crazy, not training, not doing anything except in my living room, Skype wise, but mm -hmm. it was, it was that, that checklist thing again, like, boy, this is right. This, this hits things for me. Um, aligning of life's calling kind of thing, you know, it's, uh, as much as I found it with starting martial arts, I found it in, in this, this job as well. Mm -hmm. Um, not too often can you say that, you know, yeah. not too often at all. And so you have started a school under the Kataro name. Yep. In, in that basement. Yep. That I imagine has uh, a couple of awkwardly placed support columns. We did our best to <laughs> open it up. <laughs> I, I have, I had this theory that, that all new martial arts schools have to have at least one awkwardly placed support column. Oh yeah. Uh, bonus points if it ends up being where the high ranks line up. Yeah. I, I've I I've know. trained in in karate systems where it ends up being you know front to the left. Uh, the taekwondo school I trained at it ended up being front to the right. It's like I can't get away from these poles. Right. Yeah. And um, I, I just went and looked at a space to once again open a school and looked in the basement. I was like, oh, there's the columns. Got it. Okay, yeah. This is the right spot. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like I was surprised we didn't have more. Um, when we originally looked at the building, <clears throat> of course, they used the basement for classrooms. Like that was mm -hmm. that was a thing when it was a library. So we took out a wall to that made a classroom. Um, so we used that wall being removed as our seating area. Mm -hmm. And then they had like I'll call it like the gathering area, you know, probably where story time or whatever was um, there. And we used that as where we set up the training space. Mm. Um, so I uh, were sans columns in the training area or the seating <laughs> area. So uh, good or bad, depending on what your perspective is. Oh, on that. oh it's 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 absolutely <laughs> it's absolutely good. It just seems to be a, a, a required element right yeah. you know it's it's almost it's almost like the worst you, you know all the cliche things well you're not a you're not a real martial arts school oh because yeah because that you know you, you could you could lend some credibility to those statements whether or not they're ridiculous and apply yeah but i think the poll one is the one that in my head it's it's a meme you know it's like well you're not a real martial arts school you don't have awkwardly yep. placed poles in the middle of the floor <laughs> yeah yeah and i've been to a few too so yeah, I've, I may have uh, hit those a couple of times on accident, too. So <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. So for people out there who may not know Kataro, uh, because, you know, I, I didn't realize how much older Kataro was than my awareness yeah. of the brand. Ta talk about the company and what it does and what you do there and all that. Yeah. So uh, started 2003. So. A lot of times uh, people ask me, so is Kataro your business? No, I'm just the pretty face that goes along with it most of the time, right? <laughs> um, so they started in 2003 and essentially it was built out of a need hmm. for that they were hearing about wanting higher quality martial arts belts. Um, you know, everybody starts down the path of ordering from overseas or, you know, anything like that. And just, you know, looking for something better. Right. So all that process turns into, well, let's make the belts in the U S 
um, you know, that's that's uh that's one of our pillars is made in USA. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's a big deal. And um all of the belts are made by hand as well, and they're made to order. Um we all like guilty as charged, we all get conditioned to like, hey, I need this belt in three days, pull it off the shelf and ship it. Mm -hmm. and that is not us we are we're not amazon there's no uh you know prime no Kataro prime yeah not yet i was you know i'm always playing around with it but uh you know all the the whole thing is of course like with with u.s materials u.s labors right our our costs are exponential compared to you know you order overseas so one way to keep our costs down is we save that making the belt for when the order comes through right so that was one of the things when i ordered my first belt that i fell in love with like you guys make this by hand when i order it okay it's gonna take you four weeks to make this okay that's a big deal <laughs> you know it takes a long time with embroidery you know the four weeks thing is is where we're at with it for standard turn but it's not just about, okay, we got to make the belt and embroider it. It's the the process along with it. I'm sure you'll talk about it in a minute. But um, one of the things that I fell in love with was, oh, I get to see a picture of the belt before it's embroidered to make sure I actually like the embroidery. If I want to change my mind on a color for the embroidery or the location or a font, I can do that. So there's just a lot of things why I fell in love with the company and why I kept up with them as long as I did before joining up. So all of our stuff's made, uh, made in the U S mm -hmm. um, all the belts we make by hand, we embroider in house. Um, we keep everything under our roof. Like that's, that's the goal, right? Help keep down the cost, cut out any middlemen. And it also helps us remain, I'll say like intimate to the process with, whoever's ordering it yeah. you know a lot of times that uh, in this especially day and age now everything is so like click the button get it here i didn't have to talk to anybody um removing that human element yeah. to it and it's certainly like in doing that it increases right time but it removes something to me that i think a lot of people do value at the end of the day is somebody understands who I am as a person, why I'm ordering this. Right. You, you talked to, at the top of the show about going out to eat. You know, yeah. what's the only reason you go out to eat? Yeah. It's a, it's a different experience that involves other people. You're eating, yeah. maybe not with them directly, but they're around you. You have engagement with the server. Most of us have had some really positive experiences with a restaurant server who somehow made the meal better, right? Like yeah. just that, those conversations and everything. And we have ended up at this place in the world where things have gotten rather sterile in terms of human interaction. And yeah, uh, when I ordered my Kataro belt, I was blown away at how long it took. Not yeah. the manufacturing <laughs> process, but literally the part where I had to click buttons online because there was just so much involved in it. And as a business owner myself, I understand what that looks like on the back end and yep. why all those pieces are there. I understand why you go through the steps. Okay, this is roughly what your belt's gonna look like with the embroidery because we want you to be happy with it when you get it. We don't want you to say, oh, that wasn't quite the shade of this or the placement of that that I thought it was going to be, right? You yeah. want everybody to be happy. And you can't do that with, you know, two day shipping. Yeah. 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 That's a lot of the conversation that we have. I mean, the website itself, right. A mm -hmm. um, lot of, a lot of times we'll hear like, Oh, I didn't see this on your website. If I showed you everything we could make, the website would never run. Right. <laughs> you know um, we, we try to show like popular options, but Part of it is uh, when the belt gets made, if we have an opportunity to photo it, to put it on the website, um, then maybe we can add that as mm -hmm. an actual visual option there. But we, uh, we're custom 
Sometimes yeah. we're so custom, it's confusing, right? <laughs> I have to choose, what do you mean the size eight is 130 inches? When I order a size eight from this company, it's this long. What do you mean? I have to choose the width of the belt. I don't know what width my belt is. I've never had to know that. Do I want it soft or stiff? There's different options for this. There's different material. I can have it constructed different ways with- I'm, I'm laughing order. because this was exactly my experience. Yeah. With mild annoyance. Yeah. I was like, I have to go get a tape measure. <laughs> I have to, I have to measure my belt. Okay, fine. It's how long is it? All right. It's this long. All right. Let me do that again. That that's, yeah. that's not what the belt calculator said. Okay. Well, well I'm thicker around the middle than it thinks I am. Okay. How yeah, wide is my right. belt? Right. But what came in was exactly what I ordered. It's what yeah. was in my head. And I put it on and it was, it felt different. It felt right in yeah. a way that no mass market belt ever has. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the biggest thing with what we offer as much as have certain aspirations to become, you know, the largest supplier, right? We don't do equipment, right? We, uh, we've tried uniforms in the past. We're still working on trying to do those, but right now we don't have that. We do certificates because those we can custom make. We do displays, you know, the wood displays, whether it's for a single belt, single certificate, multiple belts. Um, you know, we have our apparel that we sell, all that stuff, but we're not, don't come to us if you're looking for a bow. Don't come to us if you're looking for a sigh, you know, a pair of sigh. Yeah. That's that's not what we are. We don't have sparring gear. We don't have a lot of that stuff. We're more uh, niche in that sense, right? Niche, niche, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, marketing right. term. I should know this, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's almost a departure from what you're used to as an instructor, right? Because 99% of the time you're ordering in mass for mm -hmm. your student base, right? Where you got 10 students or a hundred students, I got to order X number of uniforms. I got to order X number of colored belts. And I got to get them here by the end of this week. Very different from where we're at, you know? And obviously like what we've talked about, the manufacturing process there are costs right of course like we are not your 499 belt that you're ordering off of you know redacted website no. no um and you know of course like at first like wow it's this much for for a belt because when you are a student most of the time you get conditioned to here's the standard for it right you're getting this belt. And as a school owner, we all know like where I can find an opportunity to cut costs so I can stay operable, I'm going to, right? That's a reality that's out there for sure and definitely not knocking it. Um, so you get conditioned for this certain expectations and then you move into an instructor role and you see, okay, I know how much this is now. And then you stumble upon Pitaro and you go, how much for, for a black belt? And I think like you, of course, can attest to it, but it's different, different quality, mm -hmm. right? Different materials, most often. Um, and a lot of times, like, I find myself having a conversation with, with people. It ends up boiling down to how much have you invested time-wise into your journey? And how long do you expect this product, this belt to last? Are you buying a one-time use thing? Or are you purchasing and investing in yourself again mm -hmm. to be respectful and honor what you have went through? And our stuff's built to last a lifetime. Bar from taking a saw and cutting it, or literally trying to rip the belt in half kind of thing, right? Yeah. 
that's meant to last a lifetime. So yes, it's always that like upfront cost to it, but that daily cost gets lower over time until it almost becomes obsolete. Right. One of the things that I, you know, I don't know if you know this, a lot of the audience knows this. I, I do some consulting work for martial arts schools and, and non-martial arts schools. And we, we, so many schools do the cost cutting, right? Because it's just, it's, it is baked into what we do. Yeah. But what I think we don't realize is that it is those very elements that we judge literally everything on. If you go into a restaurant, let's say you went to a reasonable restaurant, you know, not, not a, a fast food restaurant, but anything mid scale or up and they had folding chairs. You can still sit in them. The meal is yep. going to taste just just the same, but you're going to look at it. And you're going to say, "That's weird. They're they're going cheap here." I, it it, uh, it changes the experience. Yeah, and you can say the same thing about absolutely everything in absolutely every business, whether it's a product or a service based business, whether it's martial arts or not. And if you show people with cheap belts that that is what you think of that experience, that is what they will correlate to that experience. If yeah. you show them, you know what? We ordered this much nicer belt. And you have some belts that, that, that don't require, you don't have to get embroidery. It doesn't have to be crazy and fancy. You have right. stuff that on the, let's say your lower end is like some others higher end. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to ship it overseas. So there's a range in there, but to me, it, it's all about saying what you're trying to say, whether it's in words or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to make it clear to everybody watching or listening. This is not me saying like, you have to start ordering, you know, colored belts. All, from us all of your gonna... white belts. Yeah. For your junior program. <laughs> yep. You yep. got to toss out all the other ones. You're going <laughs> to get them promoted in a month here and you got to order constantly. That's not what it is because uh, we do, we do the same thing, right? We've got our, our, our little kids program. Yeah. We use the colored stripe belt. Um, those kids, they're not uh, to the mentality to handle a Kataro belt yet. Right. And we do tape stripes and I just have a thing where I'm not putting tape stripes on a Kataro belt. <laughs> so if anybody gets tape stripes, uh, while they're training with us, they're not getting a Kataro belt. Once they move up into our solid colors, yeah. uh, we don't do stripes anymore. Then, okay, now you get your Kataro belt with your name on it kind of thing. But that's just what, what we have done. Sure. And I know just from the time that I've worked there, we've got people that do just their black belts with us, just their master level belts with us, brown belts and up. We've got jiu-jitsu community orders from us a lot yeah because uh, you get a lot of folks who might be in a white belt for years absolutely right so everybody's going to be different um on what they what they can do and what they want to do but um it's always a thing for me like if they if somebody hasn't tried finding something above and beyond like the norm I encourage that, whether it's ordering a Kataro belt or, you know, looking for the nicer uniform or the higher quality gear, whatever it is, like, mm -hmm. because you can always go back, right? You can always say, you know what, that was for, for the cost. It's just not, not for me. Didn't meet my expectations. I'm happy with this stuff, but I think it, it's kind of reflective on the martial arts journey in general, right? It's not about the stagnation. If you just, stay here there isn't as much potential growth as you could have exploring something you can always come back to that lane if you if you need to mm. but isn't that the whole point like why this age-old thing has lasted is because we've explored these new things we've looked for that personal growth uh we've we've tried the unknown to see if it's a right fit for us yeah you know that's why there's so many different styles out there because it's not one style does not fit everybody. And that that I I find that being reflective in all aspects of my life. Like I gotta try this this thing. I haven't done it before. 
Um, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but let's just see. Let's just see. You know, mm. what's the whole point of the theme of the month in class if you don't try to practice it, right? Well said. Yeah. So what's coming next? What's what what do you when you look into the future, you know, are there boxes that you want to check? Yeah. So um, you know, my my next black belt student, of course, that's that's mm -hmm. a big thing for me. Um my so the kid that I've been working with through Skype, right? He uh he wants to open up a school. Nice. That's that's his thing. He's uh trying to think of when he tested but he just tested for his second degree with me not too long ago mm -hmm. um and for me you know you got to be third before you open up a school that's that's just the way that we do it i know others do it differently so not knocking anybody on however their process is but for me like be a third so that way you have that experience in that black belt rank for a while um so he wants to do that so that's kind of like the next thing that's in my mind as far as the box being ticked is seeing one of my students open their own school. That would be awesome. I'd love to see that, especially if it's successful for him. Um, my son, he trains with me. Nice. So uh, we literally just got back from a tournament this past weekend. Um, and it was his first tournament that he competed at. And yeah, fun. Oh, yeah. Well, he was very sad to leave the water park. <laughs> he was more upset to leave the water park at the tournament venue than he was to leave Disney when we went. So must have been a good time. Right. Um, but yeah, we had we had a group of eight that went to this tournament. Almost everybody. It was their first tournament. Mm. Um, and for him, he uh, it's the best he's ever done that I've seen him do. Oh, that's great. And you know, he uh, he just kept talking about how proud of himself he was because we we do that a lot. Like we we try to, of course, find that balance between, you know, ego and, and humility. But it's uh, yes, I'm proud of you. But are you proud of yourself? Like whether you go out there and you win first or last, whatever. Are you proud that you went out and did something you haven't done before? You know, the courage to take that step out on that mat. Yeah, I'm really proud. I'm really proud. I'm really proud of this medal that I won. Like, okay, we get the general, you know, you're getting there. Um, yeah, like so, eight. you know, just he is, he just seven. turned seven. Seven. Okay. Just turned seven. Yep. So I'm, I'm eager to see what he does. You know, maybe martial arts is for him his whole life. Maybe not. Uh, I definitely don't want my passion to be pushed on him and become a point of resentment. So I've never pushed him to do it. He's just seen me do it his whole life. So he wanted to do it. Um, next up after that, you know, we'll see. I've got aspirations I can't talk about uh, for the for the company. Ooh, um, but uh, I... I'm in a position where literally it's it's an open format to see what comes next, to see what either myself or anybody in my bubble comes up with that we do to propel us next level, um, see the school grow, see the product side grow, whatever it is. But um, I'm enjoying the journey regardless of what it is. Awesome. I love it. And how about website, social media, email, any of that stuff you want to share either personally or for Kataro? Yeah. So Kataro.com. Um, everybody always has issues with, with the spelling. So two uh, I always think of two, two A's, A's me right? The owner, the owner has said, uh, if I could go back, I would change it. <laughs> um, but the way that I always tell people, like if you're familiar with Kata, mm -hmm. it's spelled Kata. And then another A-R-O dot com. So that's that's the website, K-A-T-A-A-R-O dot com. Um, that's our main website. We're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, our school is Kataro Martial Arts. Uh, if you guys want to see what we're doing in, in class. Um, me, I've uh, my past 
five years, I've become much more selective with the friend requests I accept <laughs> on Facebook. So um, they're welcome to look for me if they want to, but I don't be too offended if I don't accept the friend requests. Um, just trying to keep my bubble to people that I actually recognize at this point. I get lots of updates on on my feed and I go, how do I know this person? Right. So um, yeah. But that's, you know, that's, I'd say the best way to do that. If anybody wants to send an email uh, directly to me, um, it's just my first name, Gage, G-A-G-E, at Kataro.com. Um, I am playing the role of products and school owner. So there are days that I am literally dedicated to only our school. Mm -hmm. So if I don't get back to you in a couple of days, um, it's not that I'm blatantly ignoring you. I just have other responsibilities there, and I'm sure everybody recognize that as well um so yeah i think that'd be good phone numbers on the website uh, if anybody wants to give us a call um yeah that's about it i can think of well time to close up shop here so how do you want to leave it what are your last words to the audience um there's a lot of uh times where we might feel self-scrutiny or self-doubt even with all the time that we've put into building up the confidence and things like that we get customers that contact me and we'll have conversation because i'm a practitioner um you know we we connect on a different level you know i don't know i don't want to be too flamboyant with this belt or you know i'm going to do something a little bit different with this one nobody else does it and you know there's we have this concern of authenticity with what we do because we hear a lot of criticism from our peers, right? How uh, how ironic that we're supposed to be about respect and things like that. And then we go around and we, we talk about how bad somebody else is doing something. And the conversation that I always come up with with these people when they're questioning or concerned with what they do, I tell them, do what you want with the belt because it's yours. And if somebody is so offended by your belt that they have an opinion on it, it's probably not worth listening to. And the same thing I'd say is go with the journey, right? Nobody knows you better than yourself. Nobody knows your students better than you do. If you're open to criticism from people, you can ask them for it. But if anybody's offering it without it, Probably not anything you have to worry about. What did you think of that? Did you enjoy that episode? I enjoyed that episode. I enjoyed talking to Gage. I had a good time talking to Gage, and I hope that you found some faith. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, but I hope you found some faith that if you truly understand what you want in the world and you keep working towards it, that good things seem to happen and that you can have what you want. Gage, thanks for coming on. I appreciated our conversation. I know we will talk again. Thank you for all you do out there with Kataro. I hear good things. I see good things. Audience, thank you for coming by. Thank you for listening or watching. Remember, we can't do this without you. So your help is appreciated reviews and sharing episodes with friends and buying things are all really important elements of what we need here. So please consider supporting us. And let me give you two other things that you can do in support if they are of interest. Number one, you can host me for a seminar. I teach a fairly unique method of learning martial arts. I'm not going to teach you how to kick. I'm not going to teach you what to kick, when to kick but I'm gonna teach you how to make your kicking better because I'm gonna teach you how to learn better. Mm. Is that of interest? People tend to bring me back for seminars so I'm doing something right. You can reach out to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. The other thing that you might be interested in, we offer consulting for schools. We take the same methodology, the same integrity-based, respect-based methodology that threads through everything that we do and we offer it up for martial arts schools. So if you're a school owner or you're in charge of a school, reach out. 
Jeremy at whistlekick.com and we'll see how we can help you. Our social media everywhere is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.